Hello! I'm Katrina with the Palm Beach County Library System, and this is A Novel Idea. In this program, we share with you the first chapter of a work of fiction to give you a preview of the story, voice, and style of a book that is currently available to borrow from one or more of our digital collections. It's kind of like watching the pilot episode of a new TV show. If you can't wait to find out what happens next, you can check it out with your library card by following the links below. Don't have a card yet? Sign up for a free temporary e-card that will give you access to all of the library's online resources by clicking the registration link. Meg and Joe was written by New York Times bestselling author Virginia Cantra and published by Penguin Publishing Group. This contemporary retelling of Little Women is a story about families and sisterhood that would appeal to readers of Curtis Sittenfeld, Anna Todd, Nicholas Sparks, and Jojo Moyes. This book is available now as an ebook and an e audiobook from the Cloud Library Express Collection. And now, Meg and Joe. Christmas Eve, then. Bunyan, North Carolina. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. White Christmas was playing on the TV, but this year the scenes of soldiers far from home made her throat ache. It felt weird to be watching the movie without Dad. Everything felt wrong this year. Meg sighed. It wouldn't be so bad if we were home. Joe propped her chin on her hands to look around the old frame farmhouse the wide plank floors imbued with the smell of wood smoke and tobacco, the faded hydrangea wallpaper their grandmother had hung before they were born. We are home, she said. You know what I mean, her older sister said. Joe did. It wasn't fair to lose dad and the house at the same time. Their father was in Iraq, called, he'd said, to give up his congregation to serve as an army chaplain. Joe understood that Daddy was doing good work, important work, serving their country far away, but that didn't change the fact that the new minister and his family were living in the girls' house now, and Mama and Meg and the rest of them had been forced to move to the farm. When the girls were all little, they'd love to visit their grandparents' farm. There were woods to roam, if you weren't particular about ticks and poison ivy a long slope down to the river with a tire swing over the water and a splintery old dock where you can fish or swim or simply lie on your back and stare at the clouds. But it was different actually living here, like moving to another planet. Joe ran cross country, so she didn't mind walking the extra mile to the bus stop. But Amy whined that she missed her friends, and Meg complained because their parents couldn't afford to buy her a car like Sally Gardner's parents had done. Of course, just about any boy in high school would be happy to give Meg a ride anywhere she wanted to go. But Mama was strict about things like that. At least we don't have to share a bedroom anymore, Joe pointed out. She had begged to be allowed to move into the converted space in the attic, to have what Virginia Woolf called a room of one's own to write in. Their mother worried the attic would be too cold, but Daddy had intervened. Let the girl have her privacy. It's not like she's entertaining boys up there, he'd said. So eventually Mama relented and agreed. The attic was cold, especially in December. But Joe liked the funny peaked window with its view of trees and fields. She loved having her own space. Ten-year-old Amy looked up from the coffee table where she was making something out of the scraps she'd begged from Miss Hannah's quilting bag. We still have to share a bathroom. That's worse. Your hair clogs the sink. Beth spoke up from her corner of the shabby couch. Whatever happens, we have each other, she said, quoting Mama. At least we're all together. But we're not. Daddy's not here. Silence fell over the living room, broken only by the muted dialogue from the television. Joe bit her tongue. Keeping her mouth shut was not her specialty. But he will be, Meg said with a glance at the younger girls. Soon. His unit had been gone almost a year. 
he must be coming home soon. They had all agreed to put off opening their presents until his return. A month ago, the decision hadn't seemed so hard. But now... Their gifts sat wrapped and waiting under the tree. Artificial, this year, to last until their father came home. Joe missed the sharp, resiny, real tree smell of Christmas's past. She missed Dad. Anyway, Mama said we could each open one present tonight, Meg said. The back door opened, releasing a draft over the threshold. Mama appeared, wearing a faded work shirt over her jeans, bringing with her the scent of frost and the barn. Warmth prickled Joe's cheeks at the thought of their mother doing chores while they lolled inside, lazy and warm. Granny and Granddaddy had worked the farm together until a lifetime of sweat and cigarettes had carried them off. But except for Miss Hannah, who helped in the cheese room, Mama did everything herself. She smiled around at them. Merry Christmas, girls. I have a surprise for you. Kittens? asked Beth. Not until spring, Meg said. Better than kittens, Mama said. Amy's face lit. Daddy! Joe winced. It was the fault of all the local stations running those cheesy holiday homecoming videos on the evening news. Fathers in uniform coming up the driveway, striding into a classroom, showing up at their kids' ball games. Mama nodded. He's going to call this afternoon. A phone call. Joe swallowed her disappointment. She didn't really expect Dad to pop up out of a box like the fathers on TV. Anyway, even hearing his voice would make Christmas more, well, Christmassy. He usually called when they were in school, because of the time difference, Mama said. Talking it over one night after Beth and Amy were in bed, Joe and Meg had decided their parents were trying to protect them. As long as they didn't expect to hear from him every day, they wouldn't worry on the days his calls couldn't get through because of a sandstorm or an attack. The phone rang. Joe, turn that volume down. Mama picked up the phone, tugging her bandana with her free hand. Hi, honey. She ran her fingers through her hair as if Daddy could see her. Merry Christmas. Joe couldn't hear his reply, but their mother laughed. <laughs> I will. He murmured something else. Her cheeks turned pink. Yes, I'm putting you on speaker now. Joe couldn't wait to hear his voice. But they had to take turns speaking because if they all talked at once, he got them mixed up. Of course, Meg, being the oldest, got the receiver first. Joe jiggled from foot to foot as Meg told their father about organizing the canned food drive at school, as if she hadn't spent the last student council meeting flirting with Ned Moffat. Finally, it was Joe's turn. She reached for the phone, but Amy snatched it away. Hey! Joe said. Shh, it's all right, Mama said. It wasn't all right. It wasn't fair. Joe needed to talk to Dad, and he wanted to talk to her. She knew he did. At the dinner table, while the others chattered about movies or friends, she and Dad always talked about what she was reading or thinking, tossing sentences back and forth the way another father and daughter might play catch. But Amy got away with it because she was adorable. Not responsible like Meg, or good at school like Joe, or sweet like Beth, but small and super cute. Their own little Disney princess with big blue eyes and smooth blonde hair. Standing next to her, Joe felt like a giraffe, all long legs and knobby knees and spots. Amy shot her a triumphant look and tucked the receiver out of reach beneath her chin. I'm making you a present, she told Dad. A wallet with all her pictures in it. Which explains the mess on the coffee table. Thank you, princess. You won't have it in time for Christmas, though. That's okay. I got the care package you sent. I appreciate the cookies and the movies. Give me the phone, Joe said. Amy angled her body away, still holding the receiver tight. I put in White Christmas. I saw. It made me think of you. Are you watching it? Not tonight. One of the other soldiers needed it tonight. He came into my tent to browse the DVDs and stayed a while talking. But I'm listening to your Christmas CD. That's from Beth. Mouse? Is she there? Amy thrust the phone at Beth, who clasped her hands in front of her, twisting her fingers together. Oh, but 
I, what about Joe? But Buffy needed to talk to Daddy even more than Joe did. Hardly a week went by without Beth reporting to the school nurse complaining of cramps, a headache, an upset stomach, whatever ailment would get her excused from class that day. She's adjusting, Mama had said. To the move, Joe wondered. Or to their father being gone. It's okay, Joe forced the words out. We have plenty of time. Fifteen minutes. Eleven of them gone already, whizzing by like bullets. One for every month that Dad had been away. I say my prayers for you every night, Beth told Dad. That's my good girl. He asked how she was feeling, if she was still practicing her guitar. Joe's turn, Mama said at last. Joe took the phone eagerly, but when she tried to speak, all her emotions rushed in on her, congesting her chest, sticking in her throat. Hi, Daddy. Her voice cracked. Hey, little woman. How, how's your Christmas? Good. They made us a real holiday dinner here on base. Turkey and stuffing, he said heartily. We're having turkey, too, she said, hungering for his attention, his approval. Mama held up a finger. One minute left. I love you. Take care of Mama and your sisters for me. Joe swallowed hard. I will. I'm proud of you. Proud of all my girls. I think of you every day and ask God to bless you and keep you safe and strong. Let me say goodbye to your mother now. Love you, Joe choked out. She surrendered the phone, her heart burning. She hardly got to talk to him at all. She didn't get to tell him about the poems she published in the student newspaper, or the English paper she wrote on the Brontes, or... She's fine, their mother was saying. We're all fine. We love you. We're getting cut off. Love you too, honey. Merry Christmas. God bless you. Merry Christmas! They all chorused. The connection cut off. Silence fell as cold as snow. Beth's eyes swam with unshed tears. Amy's face was blotchy. God bless us, everyone. Dickens, Joe thought, but Daddy wasn't here to appreciate the reference. Well... Mama took a deep breath, released it. Time for some Christmas music. Joe stared, but then she saw how their mother gripped the phone like she couldn't bear to let it go. All those years their father was a minister, their mother never once complained about his hours or his charity cases. When he gave up his congregation in town to join the army, she talked about his sacrifices. But she sacrificed, too. It couldn't have been easy for her to move back down on the farm to make the transition from pastor's wife to goat farmer. We could put on Bethy's Christmas CD, Meg said. It'll be just like listening with Daddy. Not really, Joe thought, but Beth's face glowed. What a wonderful idea, Mama said. Beth jumped up to put the music on. And we can open presents, Amy said. Not until after dinner, Meg, the rule follower, said. Actually, I think now is the perfect time, Mama said. You girls deserve a treat. Me first! I'm the youngest! Mama smiled at Joe. I think Joe should choose first. And that's when Joe knew what she had to do. Pretty, responsible Meg took after Mama the model daughter. But Jo had always considered herself their father's child. She was determined to live up to his expectations. Take care of Mama and your sisters for me. Jo surveyed the piles under the sad, stiff, artificial tree. That flat rectangle? A book, for sure. The bigger box? Well, she'd asked for a laptop this year, but it was probably only clothes. New pajamas, maybe, or a hoodie. Hey, plenty of kids didn't get that much. She ought to be grateful. This one, she said, and laid a squashy package in their mother's lap. Mama looked down at the lopsided bow, a pucker between her brows. 
But honey, this has my name on it. I know. Jo stuck out her chin. The rule is we each pick one present. I want you to open this one. Mama smoothed the crinkled paper without speaking as Bethy's carols played from the old speakers. And this one, Meg said, sliding another present from under the tree. Their mother frowned. Oh, I don't think... My turn. Beth added her gift to the others. Girls. Mama stopped, her hands stroking the bright packages in her lap. This is so incredibly sweet. I'm so proud of you. But you should open your own presents tonight. It's Christmas Eve. Christmas is about giving, Meg said. That's what you always tell us. She looked meaningfully at Amy. Their little sister sighed. I got you something, too. She dug under the tree, adding a bag covered in glitter to the pile on their mother's lap. Well. Mama smiled around at them all, their eyes shining. I don't know what to say. Open them, Joe said. Yeah, open them, said Amy. Their mother peeled the tape from Joe's present. Later, Joe knew she would fold the wrapping paper to reuse again next year. Slippers, Mama said, holding them up. Joe shuffled her feet. I thought you could keep them by the back door to change into when you come in from the barn. They're perfect, Mama said. So warm. Meg gave her work gloves. To keep your hands nice, she explained. Amy had made their mother a necklace, a sand dollar and some beads threaded on a silk cord. Beth's gift was a pair of ceramic salt and pepper shakers shaped like bluebirds. Beautiful, their mother said. Beth blushed. It's not much. None of their presents were expensive or grand, but Mama acted as if they'd showered her with the contents of the jewelry counter at Belk Department Store. She touched and exclaimed over each gift, offering hugs and praise as the younger girls perched on the arms of her chair. Meg's face was wreathed in smiles. Joe's eyes were wet. The music wrapped them in ribbons of sound. Stars are brightly shining. Joe sniffled happily. Finally, it felt like Christmas.